uh, had in, in performance was his ability to appropriate uh, around him a, a select group of, of uh, pupils who did uh, very interesting uh, contributions to the uh, modern, our uh, modern knowledge of neuroscience with the, particularly, with, the, with the particularity that most of the main, or almost all the, the main uh, discoveries of this group of people, among them Pedro de Ortega, are still uh, uh, true or accepted uh, almost one century afterwards. And this morning I was talking about uh, Nicolas Achucano, that was entrusted personally by Alois Alzheimer to come here, who was in Denmark organized the embryo, the embryo of the mental uh, services in Washington that afterwards was part of the uh, NIH. And in this direct student of Nicolas uh, Chicago, but the, the premature death of this guy uh, made him a, an independent researcher. Uh, in connection with Kafka. As you perfectly know, Mayalin appears in, in, in the black others, that are the sarks and the electric fishes, etc. And the special composition of this uh, uh, membrane uh, differentiation, <coughs> it, it is especially rich in lipids and with a very particular composition of proteins within the entire brain allows to increase uh, the uh, conduction velocity from the conduction velocity that uh, the, ver the invertebrates uh, central nervous system used to have one meter per second to our five, uh, 50 or uh, 100 meters uh, per second without increasing incredibly the size of the axons as happens in the cephalops uh, in the cephalopods and the uh, octopus, etc., as it was well described. This uh, myelin is a differentiation of the cell uh, membrane of the oligodendrocytes, and as you know, uh, when some oligodendrocytes die, there is a disruption in the conduction velocity of these uh, uh, nerve impulses, and if the number of oligodendrocytes, dead oligodendrocytes, is larger, yeah, we have a, a, a big lesion, a big plague, and the symptoms appear in people with multiple sclerosis <coughs> or some other uh, diseases. Here we have the, the list, or a list of the primary demyelinating diseases where the, more, the, the most prototypic multiple sclerosis, of course. Here you have images of multiple sclerosis. But it's also important to know that the myelination is very important as a secondary uh, element in different collateral radiological diseases, like spinal cord and muscular uh, trauma, a stroke, uh, Alzheimer, etc. And it's even naturally lost uh, due to normal aging. Of course, when we say that uh, uh, oligodendrocytes die in multiple sclerosis, we know that the pathogenesis of this uh, disease is much more complex. It included uh, or it includes cardiovascular uh, inflammation, accidental damage, of course, the and at the very end, it would include the reactive diagnosis. Uh, but the main one should be quite uh, provo provocative. And just, just before the talk of uh, the department here, uh, there are some people who know who think that the classic <coughs> immunopathological view of the pathogenesis of the mess. Uh, it is too restricted to the current knowledge about the, the, the pathogenesis of, of this disease because we know that a relevant percentage of MS cases 
derived from hypoxia, like hypoxia. and so that the oligodendrocytes in itself eventually, or with all the types of primary deaths of oligodendrocytes with no immune or autoimmune information. <laughs> It's a big problem because since 1993, where the first specific uh, drug to treat MS was uh, released in the market in the States, to today, that is more or less the actualized version of this slide with a large number of uh, agents and drugs. All of these treatments are the most But the first thing that we have to is the of the Or And since that this is quite strange because <coughs> in the adult brain there are uh, a substantial amount of oligodendrocytes of cells that are, uh, it is much more clear now that it's not exactly the same as the oligodendrocytes of cells during the development, but they have many uh, abilities, um, physiological properties that serve. For example, they are able to, uh, to proliferate and they are able to migrate uh, towards the lesion sites and even they uh, produce uh, nearly generated oligodendrocytes sites and migrate for nearly sites, both in physiological conditions and also as a response in the after injury. During development, there are many of these oligodendrocytes of cells, and they, from the oligodendrocytes niches, they colonize the entire central nervous system, both the, the white matter, where they form the, the myelin tracts, but also the, the, the gray matter, and in the different ways of colonization, it is not some random, but they follow a, a, an orchestra of different uh, molecules that guide these uh, oligodendrocytes of cells in their migration to uh, colonize the different structures and form the different uh, cells in the family targets. <coughs> but depending on the structure that you look at in the, in the human brain, in the adult human brain, between 5 and 8 percent of the total cells in the CNS are uh, oligodendrocytes of cells in your brain and in the brain of, of the patients. And as I said, these cells do react and while they disperse in the, in the brain in, in normal conditions, they react and they uh, go, sorry, they travel uh, towards the, the lesions and they 
the uh, are able to spontaneously remediate part of these lessons. It has been also shown that if we transplant all these seeds isolated from uh, a green uh, mouse, these all these seeds are able to uh, differentiate and to eliminate some of the demyelinated axons, but not all of them. So it is true that in general, if we consider pathologically what is uh, the progression of the lesions in, in multiple sclerosis, we will see the first step that is normally an active lesion with a, a, a substantial demyelination that is represented here in light blue or very light blue. Even with new axons within uh, the, the active plane or uh, active lesion that we want, that is fulfilled of microbia and macrophages and also lymphocytes of the parenchyma, we will see that there are two kinds of evolution of this active phase. First, it could be remediated by local oligodendrocytic cells and also from different parts of the brain that would migrate towards the lesion and uh, restore part of the, of the myelin lost in the condition. Situation that only 12% of uh, reposition of the lost myelin would significantly ameliorate the symptoms in the experimental models. But also, they can truly fight and became a larger lesion, that is called, for example, chronic active lesion, where the, almost all the axons within the play are now new, the, the loss of myelin is very extensive, they are very few macrophages and lymphocytes in the lesion, but in the very black, there is an accumulation of both uh, inflammatory cells and also polyorganic cells. And it's very interesting because the active remediation uh, scenario that is present in the entire plate in the active lessons, it is limited to the very plate in the product. And these can even chronify uh, more and became a chronic and strong reactive immunity and no signs of inflammatory cells or In this case, we have uh, tried to summarize which is which are the views that have been involved in modern immunity that are in MS in human MS plates. And as you can see, in general, the, the, the code is in green, those views uh, that experimental data support and the notion that they are pro remediating or pro remediating views and in red those interfering with the standard. And as you can see, the, the, the active and then negatively remunerating lesion uh, can change or can mute the core of this uh, active lesion to a non remunerating uh, scenario with the upregulation or stronger upregulation of a capital field. And even more, the, the presence of other fields uh, in the in the current active, the inactive lessons show that it is impossible to restore our brain. So everything that we could, we could think of uh, uh, promote this spontaneous remediation should be in the scenarios where active uh, uh, remediation exists, the active plates, or at least the current inactive plates, in order to the current active plates in order to, to promote this in our lab, we benefit from um, the, a protocol that we designed in order to isolate a large amount of muscular cells, not only from embryonic and congenital tissue, that is the most uh, common source of OPCs uh, used uh, in most of the labs, but also to see what happens with these cells from when they are isolated major adult uh, cellular cortex, 
Of course, the numbers that we get are not uh, very high, but if you compare with the previous uh, protocols, ours is uh, much more productive. And it also allows us to isolate OPCs from neurosurgical samples from uh, patients of uh, different uh, diseases who should pass through the hands of the neurosurgeon. And this is very important for us because at the very end, we are, uh, as you will see, there is a, a very important heterogeneity uh, of the this cell population, not only due to the inventory, not only the ends of these animals, but also <coughs> when we compare uh, from different species and maintaining the other variants. We are very interested, as I told you, in the for example, that is one of the things that I said before that in our hands seems to be pro and very promising for the future. And indeed, when we put uh, human OPCs, we see that the, uh, <coughs> these cells migrate uh, faster uh, also in the, in the human OPCs, as we have seen yeah, from mouse, etc. But again, I should emphasize that all the tests should, should be taken carefully. Because, for example, if you see, if we compare the heterogeneity uh, of OPCs from different origins, all of them from the cerebral cortex, but isolated from the mouse at the myonic, postnatal, or young adults, or adults uh, on, on the right, for example, also on the human adults, you will see that depending on the cue that you are analyzing the effects are more or less conserved, as is the case for FGF2 migration, that you see that is almost in all the cases increasing the migration and showing a monogenic effect, but other cues are not exactly the same. So this is very important for us because at the very end in order to have a, a proof of concept of a, a, one of these agents to be uh, promoting clinical trials, we think that it's very important to have both the effects in adult uh, OPCs, uh, adult mice or rats, and also the most physiological available OPCs that, would be, that are isolated from these samples in this case. In this case, we have. Uh, contact with a group in Spain who works in, in the design of chemical compounds that are uh, specific inhibitors of phosphodiesterase 7 and enzyme. Inhibitors of phosphodiesterase 7 are present in the coffee, in the chocolate, in the tea, uh, but these are chemically designed in order to be more potent and at least to have less uh, side effects. Phosphodiesterase 7 is present in all the OPCs during all the entire life of these cells. And this is something that we check first in vitro, and we see two very interesting things in order to think in these uh, uh, agents as curative drugs for MS. First, that they increase uh, the survival of OPCs in vitro without affecting the product. These cells do not become cancerogenic like uh, if we treat them with inhibitors of phosphodiesterase uh, uh, cell. Uh, from this uh, work in vitro, we get a first uh, essay uh, with more impressive results with the PC 3.6 and also VP 1.15. And then we saw that in the OPCs that we have isolated from the human sample from the Australian. And we also see that the incident of phosphodiesterase 7 in these cells that is also present in all the OPCs increased significantly increased the formation of uh, myelin forming phenotypes, especially in the case of BP 1.5. That is very important because it has. Uh, 
has the best uh, side effects than one of the or the only inhibitor for previous seven that is available in the world that is called Now we are <laughs> finalizing this uh, study, also testing different models of the elimination. What happens when we treat in vivo uh, with these uh, blocker agents? And not only with BP1.3, but also BP3.3, that would be even more effective since the, the chemical or pharmacological point of view, in order to uh, try to start. A kind of uh, trial for these drugs. And <coughs> as you can see here, the uh, remyelination is uh, increased in spontaneous remyelination. And in the case of uh, lysolecity uh, model that is here, or in the case of the cubism model, there is a, a restore of remyelination uh, when uh, we treat. So in general, what we are focusing is in, in this uh, research line is both in analyzing the different cues that are normally involved in animation, normal animation during development and in the young adult group, in order to see how did they change not only in animal models of the disease but also in human samples, in lessons of people with uh, MS, in order to explore which of them would be promoted or antagonized in order to potentiate the spontaneous remuneration ability of the species that are in your brain and in the brain. And we are also very involved in the promotion of the works of the selective inhibitors of phosphorus 97 to try to uh, promote that. Uh, because of the characteristics of the drug and also the lack of side effects, etc. It is very important then that when we say that BIBR023 or GM disorder humanized antibody uh, <coughs> are putative programming drugs. We should take into consideration that most of this test that has been uh, described here, when we can paralyze or we uh, promote OPCs differentiation towards other, uh, towards uh, minor form phenotypes, has been done in general in uh, OPCs isolated from the <coughs> cortex of physio <coughs> rats or mice. And as I remember, as I remind you from before, it should be very convenient to test these components also in OPCs isolated from human adults. We know that they are not normal OPCs because there's people that are suffering from the for different causes, but are the most physiological OPCs that we have in our hands in order to compare with that that are in the brain of and this should be very convenient in order to, uh, to propose any step forward like a, a clinical trial. So this is very important for us and as a take on message as, as well as future perspective in our lab, we want to emphasize the uh, neurobiological component of MS uh, in order to try to develop neuroreparative therapies or approaches that will be combined with the current available treatments. It's time to do that for the patients, I think. It is also convenient to check the effects of the current uh, immunomodulators, therapeutic agents that are using the tools in <coughs> adult to see if they do or they, uh, they do promote or they do interfere with the, the spontaneous uh, or the endogenous abilities of these cells to repair. That would be also very important. And there is almost <coughs> a desert of nothing in, in, in research about this. And uh, 
and we are very interested in the, in this guest, that any putative new neural repair treatment should be tested in the most physiological possible or available OPCs that we have now from human tissue. That would be very convenient because the heterogeneity of this cell population relates not only in the CMS region of the origin of the animal, not only in the stage of the age of the animal, also in the species, but also there are changes in the functional uh, responses to different ages if you look at, at, at the different stages of the uh, species or whatever. And here we, we try to push, as I told you, the, our work in the EDH phosphodiesterase uh, 7 to chemicals and the development that is expressed, our own expressed in the lesson sites. And this is the last uh, slide just to show you the, the group as it was still one month ago, because now we are moving to the Qatar Institute, part of this and part of the report. We were named in Toledo, the hospital for Parliament people. We saw you also former members of <coughs> who are very important in the contributions that they have made. And uh, some of our collaborators and the people who put some money, that is very important. And we hope that after this symposium, this list of collaborators will be uh, enriched with people from the Netherlands and the Portland Neuroscience Institute. Thank you very much. Questions. Thank you for the interesting talk. So I always had in my mind that in demyelinating disorders, not this myelination, but demyelinating where the inflammation takes place, we have painless concentric sclerosis, although this is a very rare disease, much rarer than multiple stroke, but it's a perfect example of a current remyelination and demyelination that take sequences. Does anyone take the effort to study factors that promote remyelination and subsequent failures in it? And this is also very important. And I, I used to remark that we work in multiple sclerosis because, although it's not very common, it's the most common of the five monogenic diseases. And many of these data would be also interesting for other uh, primary diseases. So, which maybe have better <laughs> models because those that a genetic origin, like the classic master or whatever, would have a, a, a very good amount, which is not the case for humans. And I think that it's very important to try to do that for the software, some of the diseases that they do. In the irregular city development, and they are very interesting for the regulation of the But for the moment, we are unable to identify any change in the lessons of the humans. Um, two factors contribute to the disease development and maturation are health by lot C and also IGF-1. Are there any efforts to deliver those directly to the nervous system to enhance remodelation of both the more consumers? In many models, yes. Uh, this for IGF, but uh, up to my knowledge, there is no any kind of uh, translation into the human patients, at least for the moment. 
I actually think we did a trial on IGF at NIH. But, but not directly. No, not no. Directly. Yeah, I think there are did not work. Trials in, uh, but again, access to the CMS. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.